The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word challenges us, calls us, draws you near to us and us to you. Lord, we realize our love is insufficient in comparison to the love you have called us to. It moves us and calls us to love as you have loved us. When we fall short, Lord, Help us turn back to you for your forgiveness, your mercy, for indeed you love your enemies. Help us to share the good news we receive this day, to go forth strengthened by word and sacrament so that others may see your light in us and come to know you. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts Be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. There's there's an old story about uh, General Robert E. Lee. General Lee, of course, was the commander of the armies of Northern Virginia, of the Confederate forces during the Civil War. And he was asked uh, his, for a recommendation by Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederate States of America. And uh, J- uh, Jefferson Davis asked him for a reference for an officer he was considering for an important office that needed to be filled with a very trustworthy person. And of course, Lee gave an excellent recommendation, and this officer was promoted to the position he was being considered for. Sometime later, friends of General Lee came to him and said that the same man who he had given this wonderful glowing recommendation had said some very bitter things about General Lee and was surprised by his positive recommendation. General Lee didn't stutter or stammer. He simply replied that he was not asked of that officer's opinion of General Lee, but of General Lee's opinion of him. It's kind of a gracious way of looking at things, isn't it? In praying, especially when we hear our gospel text for today, we're told by Jesus to love the enemy. But in our everyday life, too, not just in prayer, we often love only those who love us. The reality is, as we sit down and look at all of these texts, first lesson, psalm text, 
second, third, second lesson in our gospel text, we see uh, some challenging things being given to the people of God. I mean, certainly God calls us to love, but this is not easy love, is it? We see, in essence, the law of love. And Psalm 119 is about the law. And if you are asked, of course, oftentimes we know even Jesus Himself said you can kind of boil down the law itself to two kinds of love. How do we fulfill the commandments? How do we do the law? Jesus tells the, the, young, the young man who comes to him, what, how, simplify the law for me, Jesus. says, okay. Love the Lord your God with all your strength, your heart, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. There you go. The law of love. And if we can accomplish those two things, we can fulfill the righteousness of God. How did it go for you this week? That whole law of love thing. Anybody struggle with that one? I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to put my hand up on that one. And it's hard to love the other. It's hard to love the other we love at times, isn't it? But, you know, as difficult as it is to love the person that we share a home with, whether it's our, our spouses, our friends, our children... If it's hard to love those, can you imagine how hard it is to love those who are less than loving to you, shall we say? So in many ways, what we see in our texts for today is not only a glimpse of both the law of love, but also the gospel of mercy. Now as the texts begin, and of course... Jesus does this in many portions of the second half of chapter 5 of, uh, of Matthew, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, where he's kind of modulating, if you will, the, the, the commandments, the law. You know, you have heard that it was said, and he plays out the law, but I say to you, now isn't that, there's something interesting going on. There's a, a transaction there that's almost unnoticed here. All right. Where are these laws? Where are these things? Uh, it, it was said. Where can those things that they were said be found? It's in what? In the Old Testament. At, at this point, when Jesus is preaching, the Scriptures are the Old Testament. That's it. As far as, as, far as we Christians are concerned, Hebrew Scriptures, Old Testament, however you want to refer to them, but that's the only thing in existence at the point when Jesus is speaking. You know, Paul hasn't even become a, a, an apostle, much less written the letter to the Thessalonians or the letter to the Romans or the Corinthians or, or any of those letters. The Hebrews hadn't been written. Revelation has not been written, at least not in pen or in stone, or on papyrus. So when Jesus is saying, you have heard it was said, he's talking about Old Testament. You know, the things that in many ways, Moses had come down the mountain from, within his hand. You know? And this was, and of course we know where the Ten Commandments were written, right? What were the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. It doesn't get any more solid than that, right? You know, so Jesus is here in the, Jesus is telling him, you have heard that it was said. In many cases, he's outlining things that if they weren't in the, the Decalogue, the first, the Ten Commandments, then, uh, then it was certainly in any of the other 600 or so other commandments that Jews were, were expected to faithfully follow as God's chosen people. So he says, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And and if you stop and think about it, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, I mean, that kind of sounds hard, but I mean, stop and think about it. What's the real principle being laid out for us here? The the punishment must, what? Fit the crime. crime. Anybody got a problem with that? Punishment fitting the crime? I mean, that's one of the very bedrocks of our legal system even to this day. Uh, several years ago when I was teaching in the public schools, I, I taught at Wolfson. I was, the, uh, uh, I was the director of the law magnet program and, and you know, enjoyed teaching those classes to the students. And, and we talked a lot about the law and the, the, where the law comes from. Of course, the idea of, of law itself uh, and, and some of the principles of the American justice system. And, of course, at the top of the list is the idea that the punishment fits the crime. You know, we, we almost think that it's 
uh, unfair, though, when we see that, uh, uh, you know, the idea of how retributive justice, that's the word for it, you know, you, you, you do something and you, you have to make amends for it in the same manner that, uh, that you cost the other person. And so, you know, uh, now, but of course, not every country uh, kind of uh, re- applies to that, that same principle. You know what happens in, in many uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries, what happens when you steal, right? Yeah, yeah it, off your hand goes. Does that, is that eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Not quite. No, no, not so much. It's a little excessive, right? But the truth is that the idea of eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth seems pretty rational to us. And I'm sure that it would have seemed pretty rational to the Hebrews and the disciples and those gathered at, at, around Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you've heard it said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But then he says, catch the subtlety there. I mean, here's the truth. There's so much subtlety in Scripture that we really, as we read it and pray it and, and think about it uh, and reflect on it, there's so much subtlety that we miss something. It was said in the Old Testament, it was said in the Ten Commandments, thus. It was said in God's Word, thus. But I say to you, think about that phrase for a second. It's something we can almost, as Christians with a with a with a 21st century Christian mentality, almost speed bump right over what Jesus is doing. Whose authority is Jesus speaking with? His own, and therefore he is equating his word to the word of God. The very presence of God in their midst. God is, you know, Jesus is saying to them who He is. And isn't it interesting, nobody's calling Him on that? Perhaps the idea of who it is that is speaking is part of the reflection of what we do here. And then Jesus says, but I say to you. And He's doing this throughout the, 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 uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He, he's, not, uh, he's not giving them a back door out, is He? He's not, playing, uh, he's not playing jailhouse lawyer here. He's not making it easier. He's making it what? He's making it harder. But I say to you, and there's that text right there. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other as well. This is not retributive justice Jesus is necessarily preaching. I mean, you know, we could stop and think, is Jesus preaching pacifism? Do not defend yourself. I mean, is, is that really at the heart of what's going on here? Or is there something else? Is, there, is he trying to communicate another message to those, especially those who would continue to follow along in his word? This idea uh, that, of course, if you are going to follow in Jesus' path, you will face, fill in the blank there, Persecution, absolutely. That's right. You will be persecuted. And we can see what's at the heart of these words that Jesus is talking to His disciples about. What should you do when you face persecution? What happens to you when you are ridiculed and insulted in the midst of the crowd? I mean, think about this idea. All right, and, I, and I'm, 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 I'm almost afraid to do this because I'm going to step away from the camera, and everybody knows I'm video, we're videotaping this, so I'm going to bring this down. We almost have to show this. Dennis, can I borrow you for a second? Come here, Dennis. Would you I'll just kind of hold that up so that the camera catches what we're doing here? All right. Yeah, I know you can't see, but we can. All right, here we go. Now, all right, now, if this is, it, the, what, what side of your face is that, Dennis? That's my left side. That's your left side, and I got my right hand, right? Now, if I'm coming at this with the right hand, and I'm hitting him on the right cheek, right? See how that works? I'm doing this, this, what, I'm, this is not a forehand slap, that, this is a what? It's a backhand slap. That's exactly right. What is this, is this which is going to hurt more, this one or this one? If I'm doing it this way, it's going to hurt a whole lot more. But if I do it with this... This is just pure what? Oh. Insult. Mm-hmm. It's pure insult. Right. Boom. So turn to him the right cheek, and then I have to do it with the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. 
Jesus is talking about what happens when we slap another in insult. You're likely to be very insulted. Often persecuted as you go about the work of telling others about Christ. Turn the other cheek. Give him the others as well. If someone says, carry this, and this was the old way of doing it. In, in, the, in the Roman law, uh, uh, literally, a, uh, a Roman soldier could commandeer any person to ask them to carry materials for them for up to one mile. But after that, you couldn't ask them to carry it more than a mile. But Jesus says, go the extra mile. The reality is that Jesus is really doing something different here. When we contemplate the teaching of Christ, love of neighbor, love of enemy, turning the other cheek, giving your shirt, your, uh, your, your shirt and your coat, going the second mile. He is describing the response of someone pace facing persecution for his name's sake. Even, in fact, the words he speaks on generosity are intended to reveal how disciples are to live and act as his disciples. Because he understands that what disciples do communicate something entirely different. And the idea is that we are to be in the world, but not of the world, not like the world. And as modern Christians, that's a particular challenge for us very often. The word, sometimes the, the things of God, the words of Christ are confusing. They are challenging to a world that doesn't understand nor does it want to. The things of God. Christ wants us to be willing to make the sacrifices necessary to follow Him. Therefore, Jesus provokes self-examination in every Christian's heart. And so when we hear these words of Jesus, we will inevitably have to agree with our brother, Martin Luther, as he is reflecting on the law as well. This law of love, if you will. And at this point, Luther says, you discover how hard it is to do the good works that God commands us in Christ. We also discover that we will be occupied with this practice of work, good work, for the rest of our lives. Yet the temptation, of course, is to curb or explain away the demands of the law. Perhaps we hear the suggestion Oh, do your best. That's what God really uh, expects. Do your best and God will be satisfied. I mean, I mean, really, what's it all about? About being a good person, right? We're all about being good people. And I, I find it continually, uh, it continues to astound me. Let's say that a little differently there. It continues to astound me that if you go to people today, there is this sense that uh, you know, especially among, and this is a phrase that we hear, hear a lot in our culture today, uh, uh, spiritual but not religious. I can be a good person and not go to church. I can be good apart from Christ. Even with Christ, brothers and sisters, we are not good. That's truly where we are. I mean, we, we say it at the beginning of our worship service. We are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. It's like the man who comes up to, to Jesus and says, uh, excuse me, good sir. And Jesus is kind of confused. Uh, why do you call me good? None is good except the Father. In a sense, he's kind of asking, do you see the Father in me? And certainly we can and do see the Father in our Lord for He is good and perfect, we are not. We spend our lives trying to be good though anyway, don't we? I mean, that's really kind of how the world is operating today. I was looking at some stewardship statistics the other day, and the number of 503, 503C, 503BC organizations, yeah, say that fast, like nine times, 
You know, those are those are those are tax purpose. You know, the concept of uh, nonprofit organizations. The number of nonprofit organizations over the last fifteen years has skyrocketed. They've more than doubled, almost tripled the number of nonprofit and doing good stuff. I'm not, you know, that's not my point. And of course, uh, contributions to those have gone up incrementally and instrumentally and just skyrocketed as well. While at the same time, do we see the number of churches increasing or decreasing? Yeah, they're going down. Absolutely. How about uh, giving to charitable organizations? I mean, we've, we've, gone, we've come through a pretty stiff recession, right? You know, does, does giving to charitable organizations go down? Has it over the last four or five years? It hasn't. In fact, it's gone up. You know, people understand there's greater need. So the, the, the giving to, to uh, these nonprofit charitable organizations have increased over the last five years. In 2011, uh, in, uh, uh, charitable giving to, uh, to nonprofit organizations went up by 4%. You would think it went up in churches too, right? Down by 1%. We have this idea that we can be good apart from Christ. The idea that we can be a good person, right? But that's not what Jesus says in our text for today, right? He doesn't call us to be good. What was that phrase there at the end of the fifth chapter? What does Jesus say? Be ye good? No. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That should scare us more than a little bit. Concern us if we are really trying to be good. We know as sinners we can't achieve that. In fact, Paul says as much in, in his letter to the Romans. In chapter, says, he's, chapter 7 he says, Although I want to do the good... I want to be a good person. We all want to be a good person. Evil is right there. There is another law at work in me, waging war in my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in us. That's what happens. I mean, the two purposes of the law, two of the purposes of the law is to, A, remind us that the, that the, the things that we can, should do, and, and, and drive us to Christ when we realize we cannot. We do not. We are not the good person that we would hope to be. Yes, we would love to show such love to our enemies and neighbors because they really are the same. But what happens to our faith and our discipleship when the things of daily life happen? And we are confronted with persecution. How about our children? I see this all the time. We, we, we teach the kids, of course, keep your, you know, we have, you know, don't have a whole lot of school rules in our day school, but we do have some pretty straight, hard, fast kind of things. The whole idea of keeping your hands to yourself, right? Right? I can't tell you how many times, though, children feel absolutely justified. Well, he hit me. I mean, that's a teaching opportunity for us. But I can't tell you how many times I've asked a student why they did this. And you know their response was, and I absolutely 100% believe them when they tell me this. My mommy and daddy taught me I have to defend myself. I need to stick up for myself. Really? Okay. So how is it that that is turning the other cheek? Do we respond in that way? Is that how we teach our children? To follow the words of Christ? Sin prevails in our hearts. And we rebel even as we teach our children through our actions and even sometimes our words to do the same. The gospel of mercy, however, is played out in the life of our Savior Jesus Christ. He is our perfection. He is our righteousness. When he was slapped, he turned the other cheek. When judged a criminal, he was a lamb led to the slaughter and a sheep before the shears. He did not open his mouth. When he was mocked and condemned, he prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. 
Jesus knows what love for enemy looks like. Because while we were still sinners, enemies, Christ died for us. This is the gospel of mercy. That while we were God's enemies through sin, we were reunited with Him in love through the death of His Son. By the gift of God's grace, the word is received. Faith is born. And we become, as Paul says in our second lesson for today, the dwelling place of God's own spirit. So we are indeed that dwelling in the holy baptism, the washing with water. And we are invited, Luther says, to remember our baptism daily and repentance, remembering God's gifts for us. I mean, that's essentially what we do at the table. I mean, the Eucharistic prayers that we, we say together, we, we hear them. It's the things, it's the, the, I love the German here, the Heilgeschichte. I almost got to spit on somebody to say that. So. And the salvation history. What it is that God has done, still promises, is doing now in our midst, and yet promises to do. We do that at the table as we eat and drink forgiveness and salvation. As temples of the Holy Spirit, we are given a new opportunity because of the freedom we have in Christ. Not to see our love of enemy and neighbor as a means of self-justification to be the good person, but to show Christ to the nations. To be salt to the earth and light to nations. Yes, we do indeed fall short. We return to Him, however, in repentance. Receiving forgiveness. Joyfully returning to the mission field. Strengthened by word and sacrament for greater service. So the love of the law of love is what Jesus calls us to. And the gospel of mercy is what saves us when we fail to love as deeply and sacrificially as He did for us. It's our gift, our opportunity to take this good news, the law of love and the gospel of mercy out into the world. Both are necessary for you see, we are His people. We are His ambassadors, Paul would say. Carrying with us both at all times the law of love and the gospel of mercy. So that's our gift. That's our opportunity. We get that new opportunity in each week. And yes, are we going to fall short? We are indeed. We come back together as His people in community to share the stories, to laugh and cry together, and then go back out into the world, equipped by Christ to be salt and light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us take a moment to reflect on His Word and His will for our lives.